Thanks to everyone for coming today. I appreciate you being here. I'm here to talk about a case study of Toyota unintended acceleration in software safety. Uh, the slides are available on my blog. It's actually served by CMU as of a few minutes ago. So if you miss anything, these slides are pretty dense. You can go back and get the information. Uh, so that during the talk, I'm going to give an overview, a brief history of the events. We're talking about billions of dollars with a B, so this is a big deal. We're going to talk about a technical discussion of the problems. And I want to emphasize now, this is a case study. My purpose in standing here today is to educate and inform people what the facts are. This is about understanding what happened so as engineers, as educators, we can take this information and do a good job on future systems. Because as you all know, computers are getting into cars in a big way. And it's important to get this stuff right, or else people are going to die. So that's why I'm here today. What does it mean for future automobiles? Well, you've seen in the news lately news about General Motors and Honda announced that there was a bug in their software that caused unintended acceleration. And some people believe that this would not have happened if the Toyota case hadn't already been in the news. So one way to look at this is these events are reshaping how the auto industry sees software-based safety. And I, I hope the trend continues to improve that. Now, full disclosure, I testified as a plaintiff expert witness. So the plaintiffs would be the victims, their families, the economic loss class. Uh, I saw a whole lot of stuff. I did not actually see the source code. I saw lots of confidential engineering documents. I didn't actually see the lines of source code due to some pr protective orders. But there are other folks who did, and so for the source code details, I'm relying on what they said. So this is not all just my information. I'm taking all the publicly available information I can find on the case and trying to synthesize the whole story rather than just my piece. And there's some things I can talk about and some things I can't. There have been reports of unintended acceleration for Toyotas, and, and in fact, the reports of unintended acceleration for many different vehicles uh, from different manufacturers. But there had been an, it's an apparently increased number of reports for Toyotas in particular since the early 2000s, since the 2002 model year came out. But this all came to a head on August 28, 2009. When a Toyota Lexus ES350 sedan, so a Lexus also has Toyota electronics in it, reached 100 miles an hour plus on a freeway, crashed, and the occupants were on the phone to 911 at the time, before and at the time of the crash. And unfortunately, tragic, tragic accident, all four occupants were killed. Now the driver is special in this case. The driver was Mark Saylor. He's a 45-year-old male California Highway Patrol officer. That's a state policeman job in California. And his job was vehicle inspector. And so you would expect he's very proficient at operating vehicles. The crash was blamed on wrong floor mats causing pedal entrapment. So what pedal entrapment means is you have the accelerator pedal. I, I may informally call it a gas pedal, but it's an accelerator pedal. And the floor mat gets up on top of the gas pedal and keeps it pushed down to the floor your engine's going to try and get maximum power. You're going to have a wide open throttle situation. And so the, the blame of the crash, the blame for the crash was placed on that. And in this case, as I'll, I'll mention in a few slides, if you try and brake, the brakes will not necessarily overcome that open throttle. And in fact, there was evidence of endured braking. So basically in layman terms, the brakes were burned up on this car and the throttle was open. And this incident made a lot of news, and it triggered an escalation of investigations that had been started back for the 2002 model year. But when this hit the news, a lot of things started happening. There had been floor mat recalls. And, and again, I'll explain in a minute, the brakes may not mitigate this open throttle. So there have been floor mat recalls from September 2007. But after this mishap made the news, those recalls were widened. But then they found out that these kind of mishaps were happening in cars where the floor mats could not possibly be to blame. I mean, if the floor mats are in your trunk, that's not what caused it. Or if it's a model that's not subject to recall. So then they found out, maybe we have a sticky gas pedal situation. So there's a sticky gas pedal recall. So sticky gas pedal loosely is, if you press down the gas pedal, you lift your foot up, the spring's supposed to put it back up, and maybe that doesn't happen. So they, they had a recall for those for January 2010 and on. 
Then things started heating up. There was a congressional in investigation, and the president of Toyota testified to US Congress in February 2010. And in April 2010, there was a thing called the economic loss class action. And that sort of gelled into selecting a venue and a judge. And a class action is when a whole bunch of consumers get together and have a suit over product quality or something like that. <clears throat> By May, we had some full-on news. Toyota unintended acceleration has killed 89, reads the headline. I don't know if that's a correct number or not, but that's the kind of headlines that were going around. And so this is, this is big news. Something to notice down below is 6,200 complaints. Now, I've heard other numbers. This happens to be the number in this article. That's a lot of complaints of unintended acceleration. So at least according to the media, it was gaining momentum then. So what happens next is NASA gets called in. They said, let's have the smart folks at NASA take a look at this and find out what's really going on here. And so a NASA team spent several months from 2010 to 2011 investigating this. And one of the things they really looked at was the Electronic Throttle Control System, ETCS. And that's what we're going to be talking about for the rest of today. So an ETCS called an, electronic, an engine control module or an engine controller is a piece of uh, computer equipment that controls the throttle. It controls air plus fuel plus spark. And those three things together make engine power. So it has complete control over how much power the engine's putting out. And when you press on the accelerator pedal, what you're doing is you're sending some voltage signals up to a computer, but you're not controlling the throttle. You're just telling the computer what you want to have happen. It runs some software and decides what to do with the throttle. Notice that it controls all the things. We're going to only talk about the throttle position, because in these systems, throttle, which is airflow, is the primary way of controlling power. And the computer just suggests fuel and uh, spark to, to make the, uh, the air produce the right amount of power. So we're just going to talk about throttle. But in fact, it's controlling everything. This is what it looks like. It's a circuit board. There are two chips. There, the larger chip is the main CPU. The smaller chip is the monitor chip. And very loosely, the main chip is supposed to do the computations. And the monitor chip is supposed to ensure safety. If you read the summaries, that's how they generally characterize it. Of course, it's more complicated than that, and we're going to talk about that as we go. But it's a two-chip architecture, of a, and that's a monitor actuator pair. That's the kind of thing you see in cars. And uh, it's supposed to, uh, this is what controls the engine. Now, the electronic throttle control system is safety critical. By safety critical, what I mean is that if it malfunctions, it's, there's a pretty good chance someone's going to die. And one of the reasons is that in these vehicles, when the driver pumps the brakes, they lose their power assist. So let me explain how that works. When you have power brakes or, or um, assisting braking, what happens is when you press your foot on the brake pedal, there's actually some vacuum drawn off the backside of the throttle. And the vacuum amplifies your power by, if you have vacuum on one side of a diaphragm and air on the other side, it's going to help you press the diaphragm down. And that's how it works. But there's a vacuum reservoir, and every time you press the brakes to release the brakes, it has to equalize the, the pressure or it won't release. And so you use up the vacuum, and after a couple, three pumps of the brakes, the vacuum's gone and you have no more power assist. Now what's supposed to happen is that the vacuum is supposed to be replenished. If the throttle's closed, the back side of the throttle has a lot of vacuum and it replenishes the vacuum. But if the throttle's wide open, there's no resistance to airflow, there's no vacuum, and so you don't replenish it. So if you press the accelerator pedal all the way down and the throttle's wide open and you pump the brakes, the brakes lose effectiveness after a couple pumps because there's no vacuum anymore. Once you've reached that state, it takes 175 pounds of force on the brake pedal to hold the car against the wide open throttle. Not stop it, just hold it against it. Some cars are more, some cars are less. If you remember your physics one, if you weigh less than 175 pounds, Standing on it isn't enough. You have to brace your back against the seat and push. We're talking doing leg presses, right? 175 pounds is a, is a lot of force. And this is across vehicles. This is NHTSA data, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. This is government data. And without vacuum, it's 15 to 43 pounds. So we're talking like a 10x change, 8 to 10x change. So if you had a software defect, this is hypothetical. If you had a software defect in the ETCS, and it 
commanded the throttle to be wide open, then the brakes are not necessarily going to stop the car in pretty ordinary situations. When I learned to drive, I was taught to pump the brakes if there was a problem. So if you're pumping the brakes, then you're going to have a problem stopping the car against a wide open throttle. And Consumer Reports even has a, a video showing this kind of effect. So it isn't whether or not there's a bug that's relevant here. What's relevant is because there might be a bug, software has bugs, and that bug might cause a fatality, that makes it safety critical software. So the onus is upon the designer to demonstrate that that bug or such a bug is not there. That's what it means to be safety critical. You have to show you don't have that bug. Now, if you're driving a Toyota and this happens to you, the advice from NASA is primarily to shift to neutral. So if you shift to neutral, that hopefully disengages the engine. Um, in some vehicles, the shift to neutral, I understand, is controlled also by software, but we're not going there today. You can also do a key off while moving. If you do the key off, you're going to lose your power steering, so I would think twice before I do that. So what did NASA conclude? What NASA concluded was they didn't find a smoking gun. They had a tight timeline. They had limited information. I'm going to talk more about that in a second. But they, they had some limits on what they did. They did not exonerate the system. What they said was we had some smart folks. We looked as hard as we could given time and resources and information available. We assumed some information was correct that was given to us. And we could not prove the hypothesis that a particular defect caused the UA. But proof that the ETCS caused the reported UA was not found does not mean it could not occur. In other words, they failed to prove the hypothesis it happened, but they didn't say it couldn't. They just said, we didn't find the smoking gun. After NASA issued this report, NHTSA issued a report, and the US Transportation Secretary, Ray LaHood, said, there is no electronic-based cause for unintended acceleration in Toyotas. This is a soundbite you often hear. That doesn't exactly correspond to with what NASA said. Did NASA have correct and complete information? And my hat is off to the folks at NASA. They had a really, really tough job. And they worked hard at it. And I know they did the best they could. And I base a lot of what I'm saying here today on their report. They had a tough time. And um, they didn't necessarily get all the information. So for example, you saw two chips on that circuit board, right? If you read the NASA report, you'll find out they mentioned the second chip. But all the analysis of the software is about the main CPU. All the pages of data and the discussion is all about the main CPU. You don't see any analysis of the monitor CPU, you know, the one that's there to ensure safety. You don't see any analysis there. Also, NASA credited error correcting codes in RAM in part for safety. So if you've heard of parity in memory or ECC in servers, we're going to talk about single event upsets in a minute, but basically hardware memory can have bit errors in it. And use additional bits in the memory to guard against those bit errors to detect them or correct them. And NASA said they had error correcting codes. And apparently that's because Toyota told NASA that they had error correcting codes. The exponent public report, so these are folks hired by Toyota to look hard. And they, I, I believe they did look pretty hard to see if they could find something. And they issued a report all about this. And they also said that ECC for the main CPU chip, although they claimed error correction, not error correction and detection. Well, it turns out there actually is no error correcting codes on the RAM for the 2005 model year vehicle, which is the subject of the master report. It's just not there. So this, uh, the reality doesn't match what you see in these reports. OK, NASA issued its report. And then the economic loss class action happened. I was involved in this as well as some other cases. And uh, what happened was Toyota said, we have lots of people suing us over basically our product quality. And we don't want to admit that there's a software defect. We're not going to admit anything's wrong. But we're going to settle because we want to move on from this. This affects the 2002 through 2010 models of Toyota and Lexus vehicles. So they settled for $1.6 billion. It's a large amount of money. Car companies do, do have a, a large volume, but it's a large amount of money. And you divide it by all the owners, it's not a huge amount per vehicle. It's a pretty big settlement. And as part of the settlement, 
So they sent checks. Some of you here might have gotten a check. They sent out checks to owners. And they also promised a break override firmware update in recent models. So what this does is, break override technology is when you press the brake pedal and the software sees that the gas pedal is also depressed, it releases the throttle so that the brakes are more effective, getting over that problem, all right? But not for all the models. Look at the years. Most of these models are 2008, starts in 2008, starts in 2009. So the older models are not subject to this recall. In other words, other than the floor mats and the sticky throttle pedals, you know, nothing's going to be done to update the software. Now, the brake override firmware could be effective if you have floor mat entrapment. I'm just going to continue on. <laughs> so, book out Schwartz trial. So this happened. This settlement happened. Some cases settled. And then there was a first public trial that had software in it. So there, in the news, you're going to see some Toyota um, trials where Toyota prevailed. But none of those featured software. So book out is the first and only trial that's actually gone to a jury and gone to a courtroom where software is what figured it in. And I testified in this trial along with, with many other folks. So in October 2013 was this trial. It was a fatal crash of a 2005 Toyota Camry. This Toyota Camry is not subject to the floor mat recall. It is not subject to the sticky pedal recall and is not a candidate for the brake override software. Just so we're clear on that. Toyota blamed driver error for the crash. So Ms. Bookout was severely injured. Mrs. Schwartz was killed by the crash. Uh, and if you, look at the, the, if you look at the news, you can see a lot of details about it. But I'm going to keep it brief. So Mr. Rohr, who works for Exponent, the folks who wrote that report I mentioned, he testified as our software expert. I'm going to speak very shortly about what he testified in another slide. Titus Council theorized that Ms. Bookout mistakenly pumped the gas pedal instead of the brake. So they basically blamed driver error on this. She pumped the gas pedal instead of the brake and then switched the brake at the last minute. So that was basically their case. The plaintiffs, so the folks working for Bookout Schwartz, blamed the electronic throttle control system. I testified, Michael Barr testified. And between us, we said there was defective safety architecture and software defects that, that more likely than not caused this crash. Uh, also, the plaintiffs pointed out that there were 150 feet of skid marks, which implies the throttles open while the brakes are being applied. It went to jury, and the jury said that um, Toyota lost and the plaintiffs prevailed and awarded each of the plaintiffs one and a half million dollars. And also, they checked the box saying, we do find by clear and convincing evidence that defendants acted in reckless disregard of the rights. So this is language that triggers a punitive phase of the, phase of the trial. So that there was a jury verdict in favor of plaintiffs. The jury said, we want to proceed to a punitive phase. And Toyota settled that night before the jury could come back and consider punitive damages. So sometimes you'll hear in the news that this case was settled. That's not the whole story. The whole story is that the jury rate ruled in favor of plaintiffs on compensatory damages, and then it was settled before the punitive damage phase. Now, a summary of the technical opinion. This is uh, a reporter writing about what Mike Barr said in the trial. Uh, so Mike said there were bugs that caused unintended acceleration. There were gaps and defects in the fail safe. So fail safe is a mechanism that even if there is a problem in the, the software or the hardware, this fail-safe is going to take over and make the vehicle safe. And he said there are gaps and defects. He found software defects and other defects in the system that were linked to unintended acceleration through vehicle testing. And this wording is tricky, and I'm going to be very clear about it. There was not a situation where you could press some buttons, press a pedal, and make the vehicle perform on demand. The problem is much more subtle and difficult than that. So we found pieces of evidence that he chained together. It's not a courtroom demonstration where you press the button and it takes off. Just so we're clear about that. But the standard of evidence doesn't require that. He also found, based on some government testing results and other, that the black box can record false information. So in a lot of these cases, they say it's drive error because the black box says the driver wasn't on the brake. Well, it turns out 
that that black box isn't always right. We think of black boxes in aviation as remarkable pieces of engineering. The automotive black boxes are much simpler and apparently much more prone to recording information that isn't the whole story of what really happened. He found that stack overflow and software bugs led to memory corruption, and the memory corruption resulted in the death of this task X. We're going to talk about task X. So a task died, and it turns out that that led to the, that led to the mishap. That was his opinion. And he also said that lots of task deaths were not detected by fail-safes. So, so things didn't seem to work the way you might expect in a, a robust safe system. The results were the jury awarded $3 million. They settled before punitive damages. After that, all the federal trials got put on hold. Some state trials proceeded, but they all settled before they went to court. And as of this summer, there were hundreds of cases pending. You'll see different numbers because some folks are counting just the, the federal cases and some are counting some of the state cases, but there's hundreds of cases, some of which are settled and some of which are not settled and I'm going to get deposed again probably on this. So this is all ongoing and that's one of the reasons I'm not going to answer questions. Now something I didn't know until it came out in the news was apparently four years back from 2014, so that's about the time of the congressional testimony, the Department of Justice had started a criminal investigation. And Toyota paid $1.2 billion uh, to avoid further prosecution. I'm not sure the exact tricky phrases of, of the, the, the legal phrasing that goes there. But basically, they paid $1.2 billion to deal with the situation. This only covered floor mats and sticky throttle pedals. I have seen nowhere in anything that this covers any potential software defects. Uh, they deferred prosecution for three years for, in exchange for the fine. They said they made fundamental changes to the corporate structure and internal safety controls. And also, they have an independent reviewer that sits at Toyota and makes sure they do the right thing. OK, let's switch over to the technical point of view. So NASA didn't find a smoking gun. But they found a lot of stuff that is technically questionable. They had a difficult assignment. Mike Barr and his folks had a little bit more time. They had a different set of resources. They may have had better access to some facts. Uh, certainly, they say that they were in a position to build on what NASA did and go deeper and go further and look harder. And so now, because the book out trial transcripts have become public, I'm here. I can tell all the pieces of the story put together. The jury found that DTCS defects caused a death. But they're not technical experts. Now, in fact, I was very impressed with this jury. They really paid attention. They did a good job. I really think that they got it but they're not trained engineers. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you, I'm going to summarize some of the things that were found so you can decide for yourself what you think you would decide if you were on a jury. You should consider practices circa a 2002 model year. So what we know today doesn't really apply to a car that was sold in 2002, right? You have to so, but go, go into the Wayback Machine and look at what the state of the practice was back then. Now, some of the cars are newer. That's interesting, but we're just going to worry about what, what the world was like for 2002 model year, and just stop there. The uh, you know, unintended acceleration, I, I would consider loss of command or, or authority over the throttle. You, know, you do something with the throttle, and, and the car doesn't do what it, it, you would expect it to for that throttle command. You should consider if reasonable care was used. They don't have to be perfect. They have to exercise reasonable care. And you think about accepted practices at that time. And the standard of evidence. This is a civil matter, not a criminal matter. The civil, in civil tries, it's more likely than not, 51%. It's not beyond reasonable doubt. So the jury was asked, you know, do you think it's more likely than not that software defects cause this mishap? So that's the, the mindset to use when looking at these facts. OK, let's look at the architecture. Electronic throttle control system architecture. This is a simplified diagram. If you go to the NASA report, you notice all my sources are, are cited here. Go to the NASA report, you can find a more complicated version. There's two chips. This is the monitor ASIC. This is the main CPU. So there's two, two chips we saw. This is the small chip. This is the big chip. And you can see there's a lot of redundant signals. These are two signals for the accelerator pedal, two for the throttle angle. Cruise control goes in here. A transmission shift selector goes in here. So you see some transmission information, vehicle speed. We're just going to talk about the throttle command. It's about a quarter million lines of code. 
Seems like a lot, but there's a lot going on here. It's doing cruise control. It's doing fuel optimization. There's a lot of stuff going on. So, okay, I can see that that's a reasonable amount of code for this. Now, what car companies do is they, more than anything else, is they test. And so when you look at this and say they had this code, but they tested it. So the question is, doesn't testing make things safe? And the answer is, in the safety critical community, we know that testing isn't enough. There are too many possible tests. There's lots of operational scenarios. There's failure types. There's timing and sequencing. And they're all the different combinations. You're just never going to see all the combinations in testing. It's just not practical. Now, I didn't say don't do testing. Testing is great. You should do a lot of testing. But testing doesn't get you all the way to safe. And as an example of that, there's an academic paper, and you can see these all predate 2002, by Butler and Finelli that says if you want to get one catastrophic failure every 100 million hours, you have to test for more than 100 million hours. You have to test for longer than the deployed life of the system for the testing to say nothing really bad will happen. Or another way to look at it is if there's an event you care about, you have to test three to 10 times longer than, me than the mean time between events to make sure you actually know what the number is. And these events are infrequent enough, it's just not practical to test that much. So Toyota said they tested 35 million miles across five vehicle years and 11 million hours of module level testing. If you do the math, that's one or two hours per vehicle produced. So stuff that's going to happen all the time on the road, they're going to find in testing. And the rare events that only happen once or maybe no times while you own the car, you're probably not going to find that during testing. Or if you see it, you see it once, and you're not sure it was and what it was, and it doesn't reproduce. So in the safety critical community, computing community, we know that vehicle testing is just not going to find everything you need. You have to do something else. And the something else that's been around for a long time is using a concept called safety integrity levels, a SIL approach. So what you do is you bin up how critical the system is. And in automotive, according to the MISRA software guidelines, I'll get to that in a second, you say, if the vehicle failure is completely uncontrollable, that's SIL 4. If it's difficult to control, that's SIL 3. And I would say, this sounds like SIL 3, because if you catch some brakes or you're really strong, you know, maybe even if you lose the vacuum, you can still bring the vehicle to a stop. If you're at low speed, you might be able to if you have enough room. But there are going to be cases where an average driver just isn't going to be able to. And at SIL 3 and above, an expected outcome for at least some of the events is someone's going to die. And that's what we have here. So you map it to, a, to an integrity level. And then based on the integrity level, you do some things. Now, this isn't just MISRA. This is what lots of guidelines do. Chemical process control. There's a newer automotive standard that also does it. Well, that's, that postdates these vehicle model years. Rail does it. FDA does it. NASA does it. FAA does it for aircraft. Military does it for combat systems. So this general approach is very widely accepted. And it turns out that MISRA which is an organization in the UK, created these guidelines in 1994 specifically for automobiles. This is an automotive-specific standard. I should say guidelines. So it says guidelines on it. So an accepted practice for safety-critical software is to pick the relative set of standards or guidelines, figure out what your SIL is, and based on the SIL, do the right level of process, do the right level of technical practices, do the right level of validation, do the right level of quality assurance. And I'm going to talk about all these things as we go. So this includes near-perfect software. I put in quotes and I said the word near. Of course, software isn't going to be 100% perfect. What you do is you exercise a level of rigor commensurate with the risk involved based on the severity of the mishap. So you certainly don't want the quality of software that you're going to see in your smartphone app controlling your vehicle throttle. You want something better than that. And how much better has to do with the SIL, and we're going to get to that in just a second. You don't want any single points of failure, and I'll explain why that is, because the failures happen often enough, you just can't tolerate them. You want good real-time scheduling, some other things, good, good safety culture, good software architecture. And we're going to go over these more specifically. So the MISRA software guidelines, so these are the things that came out in 94, 95. If you're SIL 3 on these guidelines, there's a handy little table, and the yellow indicates you have to do all these things. For specification design, you need to use formal specifications, mathematically precise specifications for functions at that level. Languages and compilers. Some of you might have heard of the MISRA C subset of the C language. 
That's what they're talking about, a safe subset of a language, and that's what it was designed for. Relationships between all software products and tools for configuration management, so you need to have configuration management. You need to have white box testing, syntactic static analysis, so this is a, uh, a static analysis tool. Verification validation, access for assessment, so you need your techniques, processes, tools, but down here you need your design documents, the training structures, software test results. So to even be SIL2, you should be able to produce a list of all your software test results. Okay? So that's what the MISRA guidelines say. Sounds kind of process heavy, but people's lives are at stake, so that's what they recommend. Now what's the required level of rigor? There is no certification requirement for US cars. So if you want to fly in, the airplane, in an airplane, the FAA has signed off in this airplane saying this is certified to carry passengers. In the US, there's no agency that does that. The car companies build a car, and if they think it's safe enough, they can sell it. They have to follow FMVSS, Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards, but those are more about things like do the lights work the right way, is the right visibility on the headlights, uh, do the brakes work effectively in terms of stopping distance, it doesn't really address software safety. It's much more at the functional system level. Now, the US Department of Transportation can require recalls and otherwise enforce if safety problems are detected in the field, but this is a reactive thing. The vehicles are already out there before this happens. Remember we saw about the complaints? You know, they monitor the complaints, and it's a system that works that way. The legal standards vary. Generally, summarizing informally, you can't be unreasonably dangerous for the intended purpose. And Again, the automakers were not required to follow those MISRA guidelines I mentioned. They were available. They could have followed them if they wanted to, but there was no law that said in the U.S. that they had to. I want to be completely clear about that. So what does Toyota claim? They do not claim to follow the guidelines. They, uh, when NASA did the report, if you look through the report, you will not find an audible, auditable software process plan. Software process plan is a waterfall model or a V model, usually in the automotive industry, where they say, here are all the steps we're going to do for our process. And NASA didn't talk about taking that process plan and auditing to see if they really followed the process. So that's SQA. They didn't talk about that. NASA also did not disclose a written safety argument. So NASA didn't talk about any document that said, here's why we think we're safe, and here's the evidence to support that. You don't find a discussion of that in the NASA paper. <clears throat> Excuse me. Toyota's expert in the book out trial offered two basic opinions. So the information we have publicly, this is basically their explanation for why they think they're safe. They said they couldn't find a realistic ETCS fault that explains what caused the book out mishap. They looked at the system to some level of detail, and they didn't see anything that could cause it. Also, they said that any realistic failure would be caught and mitigated by fail-safes. So they said, we looked hard, we didn't find anything, and we're pretty sure, to some level degree, not quite sure what that level degree is, but we're pretty sure that, you know, if something had happened, a fail-safe would have caught it. That's it. Well, that's what they hang their hat on. The exponent public report basically does the same thing, and they also say same fault containment region fail-safes. So the fail-safes, when I talk about fault containment regions, are in the same fault containment region as the things that do the action. And, and that's what they're pinning their hopes on for the fail-safes. Now let me give you an example of a fail-safe, because these figure so prominently in what Toyota says. There's one called the brake echo check. And again, this is all publicly available information. The brake echo check, very informally, the brake pedal state is read by one CPU, it goes to the other CPU, and they go back and forth to make sure they both have the same idea of what the brakes are doing. Sounds like a good idea. And if the, they mismatch, it will do a safety shutdown of the system. And it can detect some of these task X deaths. Remember Mike Barr said task X death was a big culprit in this, and it can detect some of those. But it requires a brake pedal transition. It only does the check on a transition, not continuously. That means if your foot is already on the brake and a UA occurs, then you have to take your foot completely off the brake, not just release pressure, but all the way off a clean lift so that the brake lights extinguish. And then put your foot back on, and then the engine controller should reduce engine power and the brake should work, okay? If 
you pump the brakes and you do not get a clean lift for a certain amount of time and your taillights don't extinguish, then this failsafe will not take effect. Okay, that's at the system level. Now I'm going to talk about hardware, then we'll switch to software. And I'm just going to go through and say, here's what people do for safe systems, and I'm going to tell you what Toyota did, and, and I'll let you conclude from that what you think. Uh, now one of the big things in safety critical systems is we have to worry about random hardware faults. So cosmic rays come down, bounce around, create a bunch of particles, a particle storm, high energy neutrons, hit an atom in silicon, throw a charged particle up, you get a little surge of current, and a bit flips from a zero to one, or a one to a zero. Now, how big a deal is the bit flip? Well, it depends what the bit's doing, doesn't it? And these happen all the time. Here's some data. Here's some data that shows on a bunch of servers, some of these servers saw more than 1,000 of these in 16 months. So this happens all the time. Not, not every single minute, but it happens to your laptops. It happens to every computer. It's expected. Now, Microsoft Word crashes, maybe not a big deal. But if your engine controller gets a bit flip that causes it to misbehave, it's a big deal. So in these kind of systems, and especially when you have millions of vehicles and thousands of hours of exposure per vehicle, the numbers add up. You have to take this stuff into account. So safety critical systems all have to deal with this. Also, by the way, if you have a software defect, that can also corrupt memory. And most importantly, when you get a corruption, it's not safe to assume it just crashes and stops. When you get a corruption, some fraction of the time, it will do something bad. And there's experimental data on this. So often do these happen? It's not an everyday thing. Basically, you're going to get a hardware fault every 10,000 to 100,000 hours per chip. And maybe 2% of these are dangerous. Now, this is a, a number from an academic research paper. I wouldn't put a lot of digits of precision on that. But you know, once in a while, it's dangerous. And if you do the math, there's a lot of just Camrys built. And vehicles get driven just under an hour today. And you multiply them out, even if you take the, the favorable end of the range, you're ending up with a dangerous fault, where dangerous means potentially unintended acceleration, every 11.6 days just for one model year of car. So you can regularly expect this to happen. If you're not protected against bit flips, you can expect this to happen. That's why you have to be protected against bit flips. To do that, you can have error correcting codes in memory, which we already talked about. Or you can have two CPUs and assume that they fail independently. But you have to do something. And if you have software faults, of course, this is going to make the rates worse. So every large deployed fleet is going to have these kind of problems. And what's important is you have to basically catch enough of them that you're safe enough to be at the required safety integrity level. So to do that, you have to do a little bit of fault tolerant computing theory. There's a thing called a fault containment region. And the idea is if a fault happens inside, it stays inside. If a fault happens outside, it stays outside. So if one of these bit flips happens inside, it cannot possibly affect, by design, whatever it is outside that fault containment region. Got it? You have to have isolation. And that means because these fault, once a fault happens, if you flip it a bit in memory and it's like the stack pointer, who knows what's going to happen, right? Once you flip in memory, you cannot make any assumptions about inside the fault containment region. You have to basically assume it's going to do the worst thing it can. So that means you have to have multiple fault containment regions. If you put a failsafe and the thing doing the action in the same fault containment region, how do you know the thing making the mistake doesn't take down the failsafe? Well, you don't. That's the point. So what people do is they make sure there's no shared resource. You need complete independence, multiple fault containment regions, so one of them acts in a bad way, the other one won't be corrupted, because that's the point of fault containment regions, and we'll be able to detect it and do something. So any shared resource is a dangerous single point of failure because it violates the concept of a fault containment region. Now what you see in rail systems is they'll actually uh, commonly put two computers next to each other running the exact same software, which has been very, very high quality software, and cross-checking so if there's a bit flip or something like that, they mismatch, and if they mismatch, they both commit suicide and a backup pair takes over. That's how rail signaling works. That's how a lot of train equipment works. All right? For cars and some other equipment, what you often see is a monitor actuator pair. That's where a main CPU does the computing. And a monitor CPU keeps an eye on it and says, I don't think that's right. We're going to do a safety shutdown. So complete protection requires redundancy. Once you have a single point of failure, you have a problem, a severe problem. So for example, if you had a main CPU and a monitor chip, 
And you have two redundant, remember there's two redundant signals coming from the gas pedal? If you have two redundant signals coming from the gas pedal, and they both go through the monitor chip, and the monitor chip suffers a nasty, nasty failure, it could lie to the main CPU about what? What you're doing the gas pedals. There's no way to ensure with modern electronics that can't happen. It might be low probability, but it's not possible to ensure it can never happen. So what you typically see in these systems is you see that the throttle and accelerator version one goes to the main CPU, version two goes to the monitor chip, and if the monitor chip has a fault, the main CPU can keep it honest because it has a clean copy of the other set of sensors. And it takes two failures to trick this kind of system, not one failure. So let's go back to what we saw for Toyota. This is electronic throttle control system, and you can see all the, all the signals coming through to ADD converter, and then they're actually copied up to the main CPU. Does anyone see a single point of failure on this diagram? I'll give you a moment. That's a single point of failure. If the monitor chip has a fault that causes it to send consistent but incorrect values up to the main CPU, there is no way that main CPU can detect it. Okay, let's switch over to software. What about software bugs? Could there be software bugs? Well, Mr. C, I mentioned that. One of the things you want to do is use a safe subset. And when I say a safe subset, what do I mean? You all learned, if you learned any C programming, that if you have a conditional statement and there's a single equal in the conditional statement instead of a double equal, that's pointing a loaded shotgun at your foot, pulling the trigger halfway and waiting to see what happens, right? You don't want to do that. Okay, so that's one of the Mr. C rules saying, don't do that. And there's 100 so rules like that. Some of them are arcane, some less arcane. But just, this is a bad idea because either the language doesn't really tell you what's supposed to happen and who knows what the compiler does, or it's just the kind of thing that just invites trouble. So it's very common practice today, very common today, for people to use Mr. C. And even back then, Mr. C was well known and, and people were using it. So there's uh, an interesting piece of research in 2004 uh, from Toyota based on their infotainment software that showed that for every 30 Mistress C violations, you would expect one major bug. Now again, as with the other number, I wouldn't put a lot of significant digits on this, but you know, this says there's a correlation between Mistress C rule violations and major bugs, and that's not the only publication to make that kind of correlation. So let's talk about the Toyota code quality. They had a coding style, and publicly they said they had about 50% overlap with the Mr. C rules. But when you look more deeply, you find out that only 11 of the Mr. C rules are actually in the Toyota coding rules, and that they didn't follow their own rules. For example, NASA found that one of the rules is a switch statement should always have a default. And NASA found only 105 out of 343 actually had the default, but that was one of the coding rules. The reason Toyota gave for not using Mr. C rules, they had their own coding rules, they could have adopted Mr. C, nobody made them, but the reason they gave for not doing it is that the coding rules they had written were written before the 1998 Mr. C standard came out. NASA found some rule violations, but Mike Barr was able, his team was able to do a full analysis. They found 80,000 violations of Mr. C. Now a reasonable person would ask, well, are these the you know, maybe no big deal, or, or, you know, how big a deal are these? Well, if you look at the NASA report, they did some analysis and they found 2,272 global variables declared with different types. So an example of this, and I'm not saying it's in the code because I haven't seen the code, but when somebody says that, I think of something like, well, this module thinks it's a signed int, and that one thinks it's an unsigned int, and if you get it wrong and you do a signed shift operation, you're going to get a messed up result, all right? So that's the kind of bug we're talking about. Again, I'm not saying that that was necessarily in the source code. They found 22 uninitialized variables. Uno found 89 possibly uninitialized variables. Let's talk about code complexity. Uh, one of the interesting points of the transcripts is that we talk about spaghetti code. So spaghetti code, I'm going to say, is incomprehensible code due to unnecessary coupling, jumps, go-tos, or high complexity. Now, this isn't actually about go-tos. It's in C, not Fortran. And, you know, I don't know of any go-tos there. But still, if you have messy code, it's a problem. And so McCabe's cyclomatic complexity is a good way to look at this. This is a well-known technique. What you do is you take a program flow control graph. And so this is a two-way branch, and that's a four-way branch. 
and you count up the number of cycles in the graph, the number of i's in the graph, and, and you add one, and that's the complexity. So it basically has to do with how many paths you have to go down to test this code. That's really what it's trying to get at. And a uh, pretty common number is 15, 20, maybe 30. You don't really want to be above 15, 20, 30, because it's really hard to write unit tests for this code. And that's a tough number. At 50, it's pretty common to read it's untestable at 50. And at 75, there's a good chance if you fix a bug, you're going to inject another bug, because it's just too complicated to maintain. So you really want to be at 15, 20, 30. At 50, you've got problems. At 75, you have big problems. The 28 TCS code had 50 functions with a complexity over 50. The throttle angle function, this is the thing, computing throttle angle, has a strict complexity metric of 146. It's 1,300 lines long, and there's no, no unit test plan in evidence. OK, moving along. There's another kind of spaghetti code. Global variables are evil. This is a chapter title in my book, which I wrote before I got involved in all this stuff. And I didn't make it up. Mary Shaw and Bill Wolf wrote a paper called Global Variables Considered Harmful in 1973. So this is not news. And I think of it as data flow spaghetti. You know, it's spaghetti code only, you know, think of an Excel spreadsheet. For those of you who aren't experts in this, an Excel spreadsheet where you have lots and lots of cells and one cell randomly looks at another cell with no particular pattern, which looks at another cell, looks at another cell, and there's a bug there, you're not going to be able to track it down. So it's data flow spaghetti. The ideal number of, glo of writable global variables is zero. Now, there's some things like cons, like the value of pi, we're not going to worry about that, right? and some configuration data. But in terms of globals that are actually used to communicate values, for example, in the TCS, the throttle angle is written by one function, and another function picks it up out of a global and does something else with it. So they pass values along by function, at least for that. The ideal number of global variables is zero. Now, I'm an academic. I'm allowed to say that. All right? In the real world, which I've also worked in the real world, I've written code that went into production. Sure, 10, 20. You do what you got to do to make it work, OK? But the number's supposed to be small. Toyota had about 10,000 global variables in their code. And the majority of all data objects were global in scope. So this is not 10,000 out of a huge number of variables. This is 10,000 global variables. If you did the analysis, which NASA did, about half of them could have been local static, which means it's inside a subroutine and only visible to that subroutine. But in fact, about 10,000 of them were variables that were visible to every line of code in the system. So if you want to track out down who's reading and writing the variable, you have to track it down across the entire code base. Let's talk about concurrency. So concurrency bugs are tough. Race conditions are just the bane of existence of embedded programmers. And the idea behind a concurrency problem is you have some shared data, and task one reads the data, task two reads the data, they both change the data. They both write it back. And at the end, the value depends on who wins. And these tasks aren't necessarily synchronized. They slide in and out of phase. So a lot of times it works fine. But if the stars align just the wrong way, you're going to get corrupted data. For example, if they're both incrementing a counter, and I'm not saying this is necessary in the code. It's just an example. If they're both incrementing a counter, and they do this, the counter is going to increment by 1 instead of 2, because they're both going to write the same value back. And the way around this, is you disable interrupts. So task one will disable interrupts before the read to lock out task two so it can't run, so it can't be scheduled. You could also use mutexes, which are, or semaphores, which are data objects that keep the two tasks from accessing the data at the same time. If you get this wrong, you're going to have bugs that are almost impossible to reproduce. But with millions of vehicles and thousands of exposure hours per vehicle, it's going to happen. It's just a question of when. And you can't reproduce it. You can't make it perform on demand, because it all depends on how the stars align. NASA actually identified a specific concurrency issue of overriding the results of a second interrupted task. However, they said that that particular defect did not lead to unintended acceleration, or at least they couldn't prove that it did. There's nested scheduler unlocks. So sometimes you lock a variable, call a subroutine, it locks a variable, you call a subroutine, it locks the same, the same variable. And then on the way out, the first guy unlocks it and it remains unlocked all the way out. And so that's a concurrency hazard. The shared global variables are not all volatile. For those, those of you who've taken an embedded C course, the keyword volatile says 
As soon as you touch it, you have to commit the value to memory. You can't leave it hanging around in a register. So if you go back here, even if they'd operated properly, if task one didn't think it was volatile, it might keep it around in a register and write it next year. Who knows when it's going to write it? Because it's caching in a, ver in a register. And the keyword volatile says don't do that. If you don't use volatile, you can have concurrency defects even though you've disabled interrupts and done everything right. And finally, the shared globals are not always accessed with interrupts masked. NASA did the analysis, and they basically found more global variables than interrupts. So, you know, the math doesn't work. It couldn't possibly be true, but they didn't do a lot of detailed analysis. because It's a lot of work. They didn't have that much time. Let's move on to recursion. So recursion is when you take CS101 and you do the Fibonacci program, it calls it Towers of Hanoi, it calls itself, right? And that's a nice CS theoretical con construct, but the problem is every time you do a subroutine call, it puts stuff on the stack. This processor does not have memory protection and it has a limited amount of RAM. So if you put too many things on the stack by using unbounded recursion, you're eventually going to overwrite memory. The Toadio CTS does use recursion. Its stack is 94% full plus the recursion. It's very difficult to do this analysis in the presence of recursion. There's no mitigation for stack overflow. So there are techniques where you can put sentinel values down here, and if they get corrupted, you know have a, have a problem. They didn't use that. And it turns out the memory just past the stack that you would corrupt is the real-time operating system area. So if you wanted to explain a task death, this corruption could explain a task death. Another technique, watchdog timers. Every embedded system, especially safety critical system, should have a watchdog timer. Here's the idea. The idea is you have a hardware timer, and the hardware timer counts down from some number, and if it hits zero, what happens is it resets the system. All right? And so the tasks inside the microcontroller kick or pet the watchdog timer once in a while and say, it's OK, I'm still alive, I'm still alive. The counter goes up and it starts counting down again. And that's a good way to reset an unattended system where there's no control out the leader or power switch available to you. So to do this, one of the things you never, never want to do in an embedded system is use an interrupt to kick the watchdog timer just because the interrupt's alive. All right? You want to base it on the, all the tasks being alive not just an interrupt service routine decides to kick it. So what Toyota did was they had a watchdog timer, and they kicked it based on C average CPU load over a period of time. So think about it. If a task dies, the CPU load goes down, and that looks good, right? They did not look at RTOS error codes for task deaths. They did kick it with a hardware timer service routine, which I just talked about it. And the watchdog did not detect the majority of task deaths, including task X. So if task X, which calculates the throttle angle and has most of the fail safes and sets most of the diagnostic trouble codes, if this task dies, the watchdog is not going to catch it. Last technical slide. Let's talk about safety culture. Safety culture is important. If you have, a, if you have an organization that is not really in tune with safety, it doesn't take it extremely seriously, then history shows you're, you're, you're prone to catastrophic events. So one of the things, and this is out of the testimony, there was no knowledge at Toyota for some parts of the V process. Now, V is the software development process. So V starts with high-level requirements. You work it down into subsystems to modules, and then you do test back up out the other side of the V. And there was no independent certification for parts that they couldn't or, or didn't check. And by certification, I mean safety certification. Here's an example of Toyota's unintended acceleration investigation philosophy. So the gentleman who said this statement, his job is to look at vehicles. A customer brings a vehicle in and says, my vehicle had unintended acceleration. I want to know what's wrong. And his job was to come up with the answer for what was wrong. And what he said was, in the Toyota system, we have the failsafe. So a software abnormality would not be involved with any kind of unintended acceleration claim. Finally, there's an internal Toyota email that says, in truth, technology such as failsafe is not part of the Toyota's engineering division's DNA. Continuing on as it would, as, as is, would not be a good thing. And this was in 2007. There's some other issues. I don't have time to talk about all of them, but there's poor isolation of task functions. So task X was called by the, the folks we analyzed at the kitchen sink task because it seemed to do everything. 
Remember the break override function that's supposed to help with floor format entra uh, entrapment? That's also in task X if you get the 2010 Camry version of software. And so if task X dies, you lose the break override function as well. The, they use the OSEC RTOS, which is a pretty common automotive RTOS, but it's not certified. It's not on the certified list. And they're at 80% CPU load. For those of you who took great monotonic scheduling theory, you'll recognize that's greater than about 70%. And therefore, you can expect to miss task deadlines. There are a lot of large functions, 200 functions bigger than 75 lines of non-comment code. Uh, 75 is kind of arbitrary, but there's a lot of large functions. You saw the throttle was at 1,300 lines. The peer reviews were informal and only on some modules. And peer review is a very effective way to find defects, but they weren't rigorous about that. There was no configuration management. There was no bug tracking system, and therefore no bug reports. And no formal specifications were used. OK, wrapping up, some legal concepts. As I said before, but I want to remind everyone, these are civil trials, not criminal trials. So it's not beyond reasonable doubt. It's more likely than not. 51% is what matters. And for product defects, if you're doing product defects, you ask yourself, was reasonable care exercised in the design? So think about everything I said and ask yourself, did they exercise reasonable care? Were they following accepted practices at the time that they were doing the engineering? You can't say what we do today. You have to look back at when they were doing the engineering. Was it unreasonably dangerous or defective for the intended use? Was it economic to cure the defects? And the defects have to be a plausible cause of the mishap. They don't have to be the only possible one. They just have to be plausible. And the jury has to decide it's more likely than not that the defendant or the plaintiff should prevail. And these aren't quotes of any specific laws. These are just general ideas across various states. OK, wrapping up. Um, if you look at my blog, since February 17th, I've been posting my expert witness report on this case on my blog. I haven't said it till now. But that's my expert witness report, minus the paragraphs about Toyota. So it's just basically what I think the accepted practice should have been at that time. And if you notice, some of the citations all seem like from 2002 and earlier. That's why. There's technical reporting. And these slides are available on the web. So I'm not going to go through them in detail. But you can get some technical reporting. Yuko Yoshida has done a really good job of, of capturing this. Mike Barr, the other expert witness I mentioned, you can see uh, his slides from a presentation he did. There's a video of pumping the brakes with the throttle open. NASA and NHTSA have the reports online. Go read them for yourself. They're redacted. They're significant redactions. But go read them for yourself. And the book out trial materials are online with very small redactions. My testimony is there. Mike Barr's testimony is there. His slides are there. Go look at them for yourself. It's a lot of pages, but it's very enlightening reading. The exponent public report from Toyota Experts is also available online. And there's a timeline from plaintiff lawyers. And I'm putting here who wrote it, because that, that's relevant when you read the document to know whose point of view is being presented. Some acknowledgments. The NASA Toyota UA team review team had a tough job. And without their work, I couldn't be here tell today telling the story I'm telling. So I really appreciate the work. The plaintiff source code review team, led by Mike Barr, but also Nathan, Dan, Nigel, Carl, Steve, and Doug, did a great job. They locked themselves in this Tempest room with you know, metal mesh or metal steel, took off their belt buckles, were wanted for security, no cell phones, had to go in and live in this place for months at a time, because that's the only way they were allowed to see the source code materials. So they did a lot of hard work to do this. And there are many people who have worked on this topic. The lawyers who decided to take on this case, one of them is here today, and others who have really made a great, a great effort on this. OK, now, unfortunately, I can't answer questions because with a smart crowd, the questions immediately go to the parts I didn't talk about. And the reason I didn't talk about them is I'm not allowed to talk about them. But what we are going to do is I'm going to give a microphone to my senior grad student here. And he's going to allow you to make comments at the university. It's important to have public discussion. It's just at this point, I'm there discussing, and it's your turn. Okay. Um, if you want to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, I can do that. 